our panelists today are going to be talking uh, to our theme, which is investing in community. I have Ashley Fox, who is a former Wall Street analyst and award-winning financial advisor who has helped her clients with low to moderate in from low to moderate income levels save and invest over one point five. $5 million. She's an expert in her field as a financial education specialist who founded the company Empify. Empify, an education-based organization, is created to help both adults and children understand financial literacy. Empify focuses on the creation of life-altering programs, informative digital content, and interactive events curated to teach all aspects of financial education. She's a writer for Black, Walk, for Black Enterprise and Essence Magazine. She's been featured on Jim Cramer, The Street, Yahoo Finance, Forbes, and the list goes on and on. So we glad, we're glad to have Ashley. And then secondly, we have Ross Mack. He's an Ivy League by way of Wharton School of Business educated Chicago native dedicated to increasing access to financial education and literacy. As a former Wall Street professional for Morgan Stanley and Grosvenor Capital, Ross is now a media personality at B4BT, Revolt TV, and The Street, Wall Street who uses his brand to empower people through merging education and entertainment. Through his Maconomics Media Company, he has brought financial freedom to millions of people around the world with his latest Netflix documentary called Get Smart With Money. He was also just named McDonald's 2022 Game Changer. Uh, and I'm gonna use that to do another pub Later in the month, we are going to be doing a screening of Get, Get Smart with Money. Please come into the Chicago office and see that. And if you come in, Ross will be joining us for a live Q&A following that screening. So we, we can't wait for that as well. So just to preface uh, getting into the conversation with you too, um, our theme, right, investing in community, we took for this month a WikiHow approach. Right. So we decided for each one of these events, we wanted to do a how to. Um, and so the subtitle of this conversation is how to teach. Right. There's no better way to kick that off at Morningstar, investing in community, how to teach. Investing in this sense, having two different meanings. Right. So giving back to community, pouring in, but then also actually knowing how to invest right, in your community via the start market in the financial sector. And um, personally, one of my reasons for working here at Morningstar is because of our mission to empower investor success. But if I can be honest, my personal interest was so that I could learn finance, right? I did not come from a family who had that background or expertise, right, in investing and in the market. And I think that's common in our community, Getting ready for this conversation, I was chatting with my husband last night, and we were talking about Black history, and I thought about Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. And if you're not familiar with them as a listener, I encourage you to look them up. I mean, great Black leaders um, of the late 19th century, early 20th century. And the thing that they had was they had a common ground of wanting Black people to advance here in America. However, how to get there is where they differed. And that's where the conflict arose between the two parties. On one side, Booker T, more practical, more common. On the other side, WB, more intellectual, more artistic. However, when I look at the feud between the two, the common ground of advancing kind of pointed back to economics, right? It pointed back to finance. Mm -hmm. And what we know about America is success often is reflected by the levels you can attain in that socioeconomic ladder, right? Mm -hmm. Us as a people, Black people, any people in America, that matters. Finance matters. And you all both have a background <clears throat> in that subject, right? You both come from financial backgrounds. And so I like to kick off, Ashley, if you can start, and then Ross, if you can follow, by just simply sharing with us why you decided to go into finance. Hey guys, good morning. How do I sound? Everything technology-wise, we good? Okay. 
Um, so to be honest, um, so I'm from Philly. I am the first person in my family to go to college. And I decided to go to the best HBCU in the world, Howard University. Um, and I only wanted to major in finance. One, because I like math and I like business. And I don't know if anybody here went to Howard. You were taught how to dress. So every like Tuesday and Thursday, we had to wear black and blue suits. They taught me how to eat, build a resume, golf, everything. And so for me, I wanted success, right? And it was like, I wanted to have the best job and I wanted to be rich and look good, like if I'm being honest. And so in my mind, if I wanted to make a lot of money, I wanted to major in the subject of money. And if I went to Howard, I wanted to work at some of the top investment banks. And so at Howard, like I have four internships, I worked with a bunch of financial institutions and I always wanted to do investment banking because that's actually at that time was the highest paying job. Did that for a summer, completely hated it. And then I went on to work at asset management. And I essentially had to work with millionaires and billionaires. And so I really got exposed to what the wealthy people do with their money from where they shop, where they travel, where they live, everything. And so as I started to like literally in, like immerse myself in this world, I realized that it was completely different from how I was raised. So by the time I was like 22, 23, I was making six figures and people thought I was rich. And so I'm traveling at this point, I'm wearing a nice clothes. And I realized that I really had no true concept of money when I left Wall Street. And so I essentially went into finance to make the money. I essentially left Wall Street, which is literally almost 10 years ago, because I felt like for something we use every day in our every single day of our life, it's not taught in our school system. And you shouldn't have to major in finance, work on Wall Street to get exposed to that information. And so I ended up leaving Wall Street with the intent to target the 99% Wall Street overlooks. But I actually always wanted to be a teacher but I felt like teachers didn't make Wall Street money. And so essentially, if you think about the career path that I chose now in my company, Empify, I have to be able to understand the hearts and minds of people. I teach financial education, but I'm also a teacher too. So I ended up really being a teacher, but I just started to, I started to work in finance because I wanted to have one of the best and work at the best because that was like kind of how I was raised, I guess. So, yeah. That's powerful. That's really good. Ross? Very powerful. I, I commend that. I don't even know how I could come behind that. But I think there are some commonalities, right? I'm from the south side of Chicago. So for me, working on Wall Street, right, I'll start by saying, why did I originally get into finance, right? And 1,000%, it was all for the money. Coming from the south side of Chicago, one of the, the thought process was, well, okay, this is the next best thing to going to the, to the NBA, right? So it was all about trying to make the most amount of money by, you know, working at Morgan Stanley, being on Wall Street, being on a, a really high revenue generating desk. And one of the things I learned was that I'm exposed to a lot of secrets, right? Just walking down the aisle, seeing, you know, executive directors and managing directors checking their 401k, right? When I came back, I, I ended up coming back home to my hometown, Chicago, where I worked at a hedge fund. And I'm just, ha and I'm hearing different conversations that people that look like us aren't privileged, right? It, one of the biggest things I say, the, the greatest teacher isn't necessarily what we taught, but what we're exposed to, right? And so going to college, going to UPenn, I'm in school seeing kids day trade in the middle of class. Never even seen people trade in my life. That's what made me want to start investing. And so what I realized is that many of the experiences that I had, I wanted to find a better way to bring that back to the community. And so now when I look and I ask, why do I do what I do now? It's all about trying to help liberate our people. It's all about saying, how can I take the secrets that I learned on Wall Street, both informally and formally, and bring that back to our people? And so now what I look at economics is saying, how can I make learning about finance, which I believe is the difference between life and death, how can I make that something that's exciting and, and more easily digestible, right? So economics as a platform we gonna make you laugh, but we also gonna help inform you because what we realize is people shy away from the things that they are nervous about, shy away from the things that they aren't too confident to talk about, right? People will talk about who their favorite athlete is. People will talk about who's trending right now on Shade Room and Twitter, but they're not gonna talk about investing. They're not gonna talk about how to improve their credit score and retirement planning. And so economics as a brand is saying, okay, let's take all these myths about investing and actually make it more accessible for our community. That's good. You know, <laughs> it's funny that you tell that story, um, Mac of Ross, about 
you know, just the secrets, right? And then learning and seeing people trading in class. At the University of Michigan, I had a similar experience where I took a class, I was an engineering major, about derivatives. And I thought it was math. And all of a sudden, I get exposed to puts and options <laughs> and calls. I'm like, oh, wow, uh, this is a whole new world. And everybody else in that class seemed to know why they were in there and what they were going to get out of it. So if you could talk a little bit more, you both alluded to this, but just there's a deficit, right, of Black faces on Wall Street. Why do you think that is? And then are there some ways that that can change? Yeah, Ross first, yeah, if you don't mind. Yeah. I think we just got to really look at it for what it is, right? Finance it effectively was the quintessential job in becoming wealthy in America, right? From the beginning of time, whether we talk in Bear Stearns, Lehman, the movie Wall Street, right? People who are controlling the wealth of the world, sovereign wealth funds from Saudi Arabia, pension funds for retirement accounts, et cetera, right? They're controlling the wealth. And so at the end of the day, it's a secret society, right? It's a country club that the people who are in control effectively are older white men. And so being in those seats, right? So one, when you ask yourself, why is not that many people that look like us is one, we didn't control it. So it's a country club, it's a secret society where not a lot of people understand the lingo, understand how to walk and talk. When I came into the world, I needed to learn all those things differently, right? I, it, I, I needed to talk differently. I'm, I'm from the south, south side of Chicago. Mind you, I, in, I had interned every summer, but still, while I'm on the phone with Fidelity and Pimco BlackRock, I needed to learn how to talk differently. I needed to know how to dress differently and walk differently. And one of the things I will say, and we start thinking about how to, how to actually get those numbers higher, I think every company does a great job of checking a box. By checking the box is, okay, we're gonna go, we're gonna recruit at all the HBCUs and we're gonna try to get more black people. We get these diverse programs. I was a product of a diverse program at Morgan Stanley, but what they don't tell you is once they get you in the door, they need to do a better job of resources, of giving you resources in order to keep you in the door. So that's what I think really needs to happen. I think every company, whether it's post George Floyd, every company, whether it's finance or not, they do a good job of checking the box, donating to this or that. But the reality is what are the resources that are gonna help keep us there? Because I think there's so many intricate things that you don't know about once you're in that seat that, you know, our parents may have not went to college. They obviously may not have worked in those seats, but staying in those seats, I think is arguably the, the most important thing is getting in is, is only one part of the solution. Keeping us there, I think is the next one. And I'll pass it to Ash. So I definitely agree. Um, I only wanted to work on Wall Street because I believe that I could be the best. So one of the first things we have to realize is a, not a lot of African-Americans feel comfortable. Like I was the only black female on my floor the entire time. So I worked at JP Morgan. The entire time I was there, I remembered I was the only black person on my floor. Like it, it so much that it impacted my work ethic. Like I was a, I was an okay employee. Like I like fast forward running a business. I was, I was okay. I was not the best analyst. Right. So the first thing I think is I wanted to be around the best, right? But not everybody has that mental fortitude to want to be around the best because the best, when he talks about like the people who control this country and this money, they don't look like Ashley Marie Fox, right? So naturally by default, my mind subconsciously does not feel safe. Now, I believe that I can do anything. And when you put me in these rooms, I'm uncomfortable. I'm less than like, I, I would eat different foods for lunch. Like there's just a different culture shock. And I went to HBCU. So I went from HBCU to a Wall Street investment bank in New York City. So that's the first thing is our mind doesn't feel safe because it's not familiar. When you like I've taught in prison systems, my students will want to be basketball players. Why? Because they can identify with the basketball player. And so one of the things that I looked for when I worked on Wall Street, specifically the African-Americans, but one of the things that I, I feel like financial institutions can do is relatability. Because when I was on Wall Street, I was so perfect. Like, hi, I'm Ashley Fox. I work at JP Morgan, went to Howard, graduate. Like, I was so perfect. And so, so many people who have made financial mistakes 
don't feel comfortable because they don't, they feel like they're going to be exposed. And so I think it's about understanding like, hey, if you really want to, you know, target a different demographic and find the best talent, it's understanding what does it feel like to go to work every day? Because for, for literally the time I was there, I felt like I wasn't good enough. Now, I wasn't treated as such. Some people are, but I had a phenomenal experience, but I was so busy in my head telling myself I wasn't good enough because there was no reinforcement telling me that I was good enough. Now, fast forward post Wall Street, I, didn't, I've, I have like a spiritual advisor. I've been through years of therapy. You put me back in that same room. I can run circles around a lot of people, but it took me years to feel comfortable, to feel like I belong at that table. And I think one of the most beautiful things, whether you are the only black person on your floor like I was, is when you are that only, you stand out. And so now I love being the only black female because I'm now confident in who I am. And I know whatever you thought, I'm gonna give you the complete opposite because I, I now value Ashley. And I don't think there's enough mental support to support people working in this corporate environment because we don't have any relatability often and a safe space to be able to just be ourselves. Well, that's, that's really good. And actually you, you bring to the next point kind of stepping away from your experiences at Wall Street, but then going and making that transition right into entrepreneurship. So you shared already some of the things that you faced, especially mentally right on that side. What were some other challenges that you saw when you transitioned from Wall Street to entrepreneurship and some of the things you learned in that transition, even practically, even in finance, right, running a business, right, doing those type of things, going from corporate um, to entrepreneurship? So I think when I left Wall Street, my goal was to be, so like Empify is the word empower and modify merge together, right? Like I made the word up, one, because I wanted you to develop a, a, a new perception of what wealth looks like. Because when we really think about it, wealth doesn't have a color. Therefore, it looks like all of us, right? And so I wanted to literally get people to a space where we unlearned and then relearn, right? So one of the, because that's the case, coming from Wall Street, one of the hardest things I had to do was to recognize I was too smart. Like, I remember teaching my students in the school system wearing suits. Now I know when I have my staff go, you have to have what what can connect with the child so it's important that i have the newest pair of jordans when i walk into a room it's important that i look the complete opposite of what the world lo thinks finance looks like because it has no color it's not a black and blue suit it's not a caucasian man it can be whatever it is you desire because building wealth is not about about having money it's about the mindset of the person who has the money so if i can shift your mindset you can grow your bank account you grow your bank account will grow so I would say I was too smart, right? The second thing I recognize is building a business. So if we talk about Ashley on Wall Street and her belief system of being good enough to be in that space to then leaving. So when I left, people were like, so you left working with rich people to work with people who don't have a lot of money. And so in my mind, I'm like, it made sense when I quit, but why would I do that? And I got to a space where I felt like, well, who else is gonna do that? Cause I'm the only one who can translate this knowledge in a way that can serve you and speak both into your mind and your heart, right? And I believe that I could do that because I also believe that I could be a billionaire because I was the one sitting in meetings with billionaires and going through their entire portfolios to make sure they remain billionaires, right? So my level of what I saw is what's possible. Like I started to travel the world because our rich clients went to the South of France, rented a yacht. So if they're going to do it, Ashley's going to do it. I feel like success leaves clues. We just have to follow the blueprint. And then the last thing I would say to kind of flip it one of the biggest transitions is when you're serving an audience who has a lack of self-belief, has a lack of education, there's like a, a mental barrier you have to break before you even give someone financial education. Like the fact that we have to convince people to buy a stock, but, we, but they're okay with giving that same company money on a daily basis. Like just the thought process of that, you have to literally change that. So when you do so much of that, sometimes it's draining. Right. And so one of the things that I miss is being around millionaires and billionaires all day coming into an office where if you had less than 25 million, we sent you downstairs. Right. So when we think about people making a couple million dollars in my mind, it's like that's not money. And it's like I miss that because if I'm always surrounded by people who I got to instill belief in, I also have to remind myself, actually, you also have to fill your cup up, too. 
So sometimes I miss the fancy offices, the, the sitting, uh, sitting courtside at basketball games, going to play golf with all, you know, like I miss that because that is what gave me the fuel and the energy to pour back into my community. So everybody that works at Morningstar, listen, I would love to come to your office and like hang, like I miss that feeling, especially as an entrepreneur, because you have to cultivate that. I now got to build the JP Morgan that I worked for. And I do believe I can do it, but sometimes I just need to go into JP Morgan to remind myself that the JP Morgan that I'm building is still possible. No, amazing story. I, I concur, right? I think um, when you're in the seat, it, it the time flies by. But when you're in the seat, I think we all share a very similar experience in the sense of being one of one of few or probably the only. And I think after you make that transition, it's another culture shock. But the culture shock now is there's no longer a safety net. You're no longer getting paid every two weeks. And so now you are in survival mode in the sense of saying, okay, how can I keep the same exact work ethic and aptitude in order to ensure that I eat, right? You eat what you kill when you become a true entrepreneur. And I think when I made the transition, it was great for two ways, right? One, it was negative in the sense of trying to explain that to my mother, right? Wait, what? You gave up your job for what now? Wait, uh, explain that to me one more time. Right. And now hindsight, she she was like, OK, I never saw this coming. But, you know, while you were in the thick of it, bro, what are you talking about? You trying to do right. So it was definitely one of those. But as I transitioned, I think the next thing was saying everything that I learned by working at a corporation, you start thinking about yourself that same way. <clears throat> so what you learned was, OK, how could I think of myself as a JP Morgan, as a Morgan Stanley, as a Coca-Cola? You now think of yourself as a Fortune 100 companies and now you realize in order to gain success, you have to now wear all the different hats. You got to be uh, head of business development, head of marketing, head of sales, head of HR, everything, right? And so what I learned was saying, okay, <clears throat> what, what breeded success in that seat? It might be a little differently, but the same exact, I, I would say the same qualities help translate, right? My work ethic now, I think anyone can't necessarily fathom, you know, that structure. When I technically hire people, I would try to give them more autonomy. And then I realized like, wait, they didn't necessarily have that same structure that I had. So now I have to actually teach them. But what's important is you realize there's a training program before you can get on the desk at any firm, at Morningstar, at, at JP, at Morgan Stanley, et cetera. So it's like, okay, these are the things you start learning and understanding from a corporate development standpoint. Okay, how can I think of myself and make my company as successful as the Fortune 100 companies? That's good. That's really good. Um, and I love the way you all both were able to share your personal insights in that journeys and how you how you were able to make those transitions. Let's talk a little bit about community now, right? Because you all are both steeped in that, right? And financial literacy, as we mentioned, it's just on the come up, right? You got podcasts like Earn Your Leisure, uh, Wall Street Looks Like Us Now Network, um, and now your platforms, Maconomics, Empify. I think in the Black community, I'm seeing this surge of thirst for the knowledge, right? And you all are building platforms to help with that. Um, I want to cite an article from CNBC, though, that's mentioned Black Americans' lack of participation in the stock market likely to widen post-pandemic wealth gap. And in it, it said that only 44% of Black Americans have retirement saving accounts with the typical balance of $20,000 compared to 65% of white Americans who have an average balance of $50,000. And that's according to the Federal Reserve. So you all are doing this work. We're starting to see maybe a tide change, but we still have these numbers, right? Ross, in Get Smart With Money, your documentary, there was another mm -hmm. stat that stood out to me, right? It said that Black Americans only owned 2% of stocks, right? Can you kick us off and then, Ashley, if you would follow, share some reasons why Black Americans invest less. Well, I think to truly understand those stats, we got to also understand, you know, where we come from. I think um, let's look at all the 
the things we have to overcome and we're consistently doing that on a day to day right the the wealth effectively has been strategically taken from us right if you go back obviously from slavery to jim crow you look at black wall street where we were thriving people come in hating and guess what that was the largest domestic terrorism to ever happen on us soil right then you look at the freeman's bank where all right we free you putting our money in the bank and guess what the people that ran the bank well unfortunately didn't look like us and they were doing sand banking free type level uh investments with our money right bad investments and then you really understand right when we continue to think about the lack of wealth that we had intergenerationally things that did not get to get passed down think about redlining right the fact that our ancestors were not able to own homes that effectively appreciated in value when you look at 90 percent of the world's millionaires had that wealth from real estate and so you're telling us our ancestors weren't able to own true real estate and then once we start getting real estate we think of the predatory loans from 2008 right where you saw wells fargo and wachovia get massive lawsuits because of these balloon interest payments etc and so at the end of the day when you take a step back and you say okay why are black people not investing and i too take a step back like yo relatives friends family why y'all not investing you gotta understand a lot of people are in survival mode so when ashley talked about you know i'm the first person from my family go to co uh, graduate college and i go to job i, I ain't gonna assume but I, i'm willing to bet <clears throat> people in our family as she you know making six figures the same with me yo nephew sibling could whatever yo let me hold a little something right so we get into 22 23 people asking for money right we're in survival mode not only that but then we also have more student loan debt right and why do we have more student loan debt because our ancestors weren't able to pass down that home big mama home weren't you know so when you really take a step back you say why aren't we investing well the reality is one it's a strong mistrust of banks which rightfully so i just talked about that but two a lot of this knowledge has not been passed down to us it strategically was not taught in our strategically underfunded schools right and so one of the biggest things i'm overcoming is saying okay guys look we need to get over the idea of having instant gratification and understand that you yourself are not going to day trade for a year and get rich, right? Let's actually think about the blueprint of becoming wealthy is slow and steady, right? Benefiting from the compound interest. However, tell that to a person who parents don't have a lot of money. Therefore, they are the golden goose in the family. And now they have so much angst they have so much and uh anxiety when it comes to building wealth because they are in a i gotta do it now realm and so we start taking riskier bets right people putting 100 percent of their portfolio in dogecoin and shiba or nfts and so we are all we have historically had the the secrets of attaining wealth kept from us and then obviously some of the avenues of getting wealth kept from us and so when we're playing from behind right when we're five laps behind in this wealth race. Well, the reason being is the history, but also I've, I've looked at many studies, right? We also are over indebted and we unfortunately are spending more than we are investing, right? We are consumers first before we're owners. And so those are the things, those are the challenges that, you know, our people continue to have. But I think nonetheless, you know, I'm not, I'm not overwhelmed, right? I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not going to stop my quest of trying to help get us to understand that. And I'll pass it to you, Ash. So I'm not going to restate all the facts, but he is absolutely right. So I'll take what he said and talk about moving forward, right? So one of the, you ever like listen to a song over and over and over again, and you just naturally know the lyrics, even though you might not like the song, you just naturally can spit the lyrics out, right? What you surround yourself and what you put in your mind is what you is what you create, right? If our external life is 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 literally a byproduct of what's going on on the inside, right? So from a mental perspective and a generational perspective, we pass down generational debt, generational trauma, and generational habits, where our counterparts pass down generational wealth, right? Working on Wall Street, I saw how you could avoid taxes by skipping generations and passing your wealth down, right? One of the biggest things I always tell people, because people always say like, well, what's the difference between working with millionaires and billionaires and the average person? Wealthy people have an expectation of greatness. 
They have an expectation that I am going to avoid taxes. I am going to sustain my wealth and I'm going to sustain my power, right? That has nothing to do with color. It has to do with their bottom line. It doesn't matter who you are, male, female, white, black, it doesn't matter. As long as my net worth continues to grow, that's all that matters because that is what, in my personal opinion, was runs this country. So if you understand the game that is played, you also now, I can't speak for back then, now you can play the game. You have companies that when I started investing, it cost me $7 to trade. And that was, that was the discount that I got at my job. It's now free. You now have companies that have fractional shares where you don't have to. You now have stock splits happening like it's like, like an everyday sale because they want to accommodate the everyday person. So while back then the everyday person, whether black, whatever nationality, wasn't you couldn't get into the secret society, you now have no choice but to, but to be admitted because the game has changed now. And we also have YouTube University. We have everything. Like there's so many people. Finance is so trendy. When I left Wall Street in 2013, I was like, how am I going to get the world to see what I saw, but to never work on Wall Street a day in their life? And it's like, I'm going to figure this out. And I'm not stopping, right? And so at this point, there is fear because of generational trauma and habits that have been passed down. And, and I have family members that won't, despite my success, are still afraid because also the people who run this country also run the media outlets, right? If you understand how the game is played, you, you will understand that America is the number one marketer in, in the world, right? You can now look at a recession and be, and be scared. Literally believe you're going to lose your job. Believe the stock market is going to tank. Not recognizing this is the best time to become an investor because everything is on sale, right? So it's more about understanding the intentionality of what is being put in our mind through the consumption of media, through, the, through what we have learned in school, but also recognizing, hey, I know how this was, but this is how I want it to be. And actually recognizing and saying, hey, money was not passed down to me but I'm going to be the one to pass down money to my family. I may not have had the opportunity to, to go to school for free, but now I'm going to make sure that I'm setting money aside every single month for my child to make sure the money that I did not have growing up, my child can get as well. And I think that's not something that is taught, that's caught. We aren't just missing, because we can, I can tell you right now, so many people in finance, like so many people in finance, you can learn the skill how to buy a stock. It's not hard. People are not missing the skill because we live in a different day and age. People are missing the will. And the will is something that comes from internally. You have to be willing to, despite where we live, what we've been through, what we continue to see in our environment to say, hey, look, either I'm going to leave this country or I'm going to learn how to win in this country. Because it is possible because man made the rules to this game. And all you have to do is understand the rules. And I think individuals like myself and Ross and so many people out there, specifically in the Black community, it's like, hey, we understand. Let me break it down as much as I can. And the more we put it into our minds and people's minds in front of their faces in a relatable, tangible, easy and digestible way, the more it starts to shift. So while those stats can say, hey, a lot of people have not invested, now people are wanting to invest so much that they'll go buy, my, buy, buy our programs. They'll buy everybody's program because people have a desire and an appetite it's just now recognizing and building an identity. I run this, uh, the Wealth Builders Community app, which is the technology platform to how we get our education out to adults all around the world. And we literally invested over $2.5 million last year. This is their money, the accounts they open. We invested over 150,000 the day Amazon stock split. It's not that we don't have money. And these are people who, who were beginners, who were scared. It's not that we don't have the money, because Black people have mastered the art of, of spending money. We have the money. It's just we don't have the, the mental capacity yet to recognize, let me take this money. And instead of giving my money to Amazon, because I just bought a shower cap on Amazon yesterday, let me buy Amazon stock too. If I'm, a, if I'm going to talk about the 1% remaining rich, either we're going to stop contributing to their bottom line or we're going to get money with them, right? And, and I like nice things. So I love to spend but I also own everything I spend my money on because if Bezos, if you will make trillions, then I'm going to make my millions. And that's how I see it. And some people can say, hey, I'm going to make my thousands. But you got to make the commitment to say, hey, I don't care if I'm starting small. The issue is we're not starting at all. And we got to we got to amplify and celebrate people starting off with one hundred dollars because you could give me one hundred dollars every single month. And at some point I'll reach a million. And I think that's what needs to be celebrated and focused on. Because again, 
I know how the past was, but that does not dictate my future because you can't tell me that me and Jeff Bezos are not peers. He just had more time. That's the only difference. And I think that's what needs to be instilled to be able to overcome the fear and the conditioning that have been placed on the minds of African-Americans. That's great. That's that's so good, both of you all. I mean, you know, and then as you mentioned, kind of similar to playing a game, right? In this game of life, uh, but also like life is like a monopoly board. It's kind of how I took what you said, Ashley, right? You have to learn to play it. And there's a lot of different ways, right? And you mentioned the counterparts, right? You mentioned um, you all's platforms, but then there's others, right? And there's people like us, like Morningstar. So I'm interested to know from your perspective first, Ashley, when it comes to people, fintech companies like a Morningstar who are really seeking to empower investor success, and aid people, especially during this type of market, right? And in times of recession, uh, what would some of your advice be for platforms like that? Like what ways can we help to invest in, and help in learning in how to invest in, in community? So coming from a Wall Street background, and I completely understand this from a compliance, from a everything. I think one of the biggest things that financial institutions don't do is use social media. Like, they're now learning and partnering with the right people, but it's not a, like, you got to think, forget what you want the world to have. What is the world used to having, right? Like you, you, you can't say, Hey, I'm going to create financial education, put it on a website, hoping that our audience comes and sees it. Like you got to go where the people are. You have to align and connect and you have to really create relatable content that educates, right? I think one of the biggest things that has was a big one of the biggest shifts for me is that I was transparent, right? When you look at a morning star, like you're gorgeous, you're sexy, like you got it all together. Like who are the people that have bad credit scores? Or you, who are the people that are in debt? Who are the people that struggle and tell me their success story? And so one of the things that I personally always do is I'll tell you how it is. I don't ever tell you when I'm going through it, but I tell you when I got through it. And it's more about how is morning star related to me, right? Like, I know who you guys are. Like, I worked on Wall Street. But how does an everyday person utilize the research and all the resources you guys create? How do you get them to utilize it? But you got to go to where they are. And our audience is on social media. Our audience likes to spend money. Our audience likes certain types of music. And I think while you cannot partner with everybody, because I understand that too, it's finding those that you can. It's finding those initiatives that you can support because I and I, and, I, and this sounds complete opposite of finance, but like all our community wants to be is loved. They just want to be loved and they want to be seen because everybody gives out education. But what makes you different? What makes someone want to go to you versus another company is what you make them feel like. So it's like, how can we serve more and provide more, but also ask people, what do you want? How can we help you? And I think even the school system, we want to give students and people what works for us. And it's like, well, what, what do people need? And sometimes it's just asking them and them knowing that you are there for them is what matters. Because again, like Ross said, our community is scared. Why would I give my money to any financial institution when in the past I've seen what has happened and I believe it can happen again? What makes you different? And so I think giving that education in a relatable way, amplifying the use of like, when you really think about it, like, Financial institutions literally run this country. Actually, the Federal Reserve runs this country, but financial institutions have all the money. Why don't financial institutions have such a large following? Why, like they have all the resources. Why don't financial institutions have millions of followers? And it's spending time understanding how can I grow a bigger audience to be able to serve more because when you serve more, the money will come. And I think that was one of the, I stopped trying to make money and I stopped looking at this like it's not about money. Let me go do something the world has never seen because I know they're asking for it and I feel like I can do it. But when I stopped chasing money, I started to make more than what Wall Street paid me. Like I was teaching kids in school systems. Like people are like, kids don't have money. And I let go of all my securities licenses. It's like, yeah, but if kids aren't taught, then they're going to grow up to make the same mistakes that I did. And then I found a way to make more money. And so I think if we let go of the idea of making money and trying to generate that customer, and put the customer first and their mentality and their fears and their doubts and their worries, someone can look at your content and say, hey, that is me. That person has gone through what I'm going through right now and while this company sees me. And I think that's, I think that's really important 
And it's just about the connection. But again, it's going to take a lot of people to be able to shift that mentality in a financial institution, like, because they, this is a very tight knit and you can't tell the bank that they're not good at what they do because they, I mean, they have the money, they have the power, but at the same time, if it's something you really want to do and serve, it's about not giving the world what you want them to have. It's about asking the world what they're yearning for because the people are asking for it. They just don't know who to turn to. Hey, I echo that same thing, right? I'm going to obviously take the, uh, the layup because my, my, uh, my production company works with a lot of fintech companies, a lot of big financial firms when it comes to finding a better way to actually communicate to our audience, right? When it comes to, we're in a, we're in a content driven society. And I think, you know, like she said, like as you say, you got to meet your consumer where they're at. And that is on social media, that is on YouTube. And so how do you better do that? But I also think, you know, continuing to have more conversations like this, right? Where we are helping, we helping people connect with the environment, with the with the community. I also think, you know, especially some of your offices, bring some inner city kids into the office. And the reason I say that is like, you are what you exposed to. You'd be surprised how many kids from the south, from the south side or west side of Chicago, and I'm gonna just speak in Chicago, who don't necessarily go downtown. What's their reason for going downtown? But, oh, wow, I get to go to a Morningstar office. Now I'm learning, right? Like you guys have the secrets to attaining wealth when it's all said and done, right? You guys are the staple when it comes to saying this is either a good or bad mutual fund to invest in. That is a staple of true wealth, right? Helping people understand what that means. Helping, helping communities that don't necessarily understand about retirement. You guys are have the ability to say, okay, this is why, this is how we analyze a mutual fund. This is what makes this a five star versus a four star or a three star, right? Those are true secrets to wealth. All it is is now saying, how do I communicate that? And more importantly, how do I make that more digestible? And I think whether you are talking to, like at the end of the day, whether we're talking to black people, Hispanic, or white or Asian, or you know, it, at the end of the day, a lot of people don't understand how to analyze a mutual fund. You guys are the epitome, the quintessential pillar when a person says this is a good mutual fund or not. You guys literally say this is a five star or four star. Like there are so many um, investment mandates when it comes from a retirement standpoint, they won't invest unless it's a four or five star. But to the individual person, they have no idea what a mutual fund is or better yet, they have no idea how to analyze it. So I think you guys saying, okay, let's have a strategy and figure out how we want to get better at communicating with communities? Is it through social media? Is it through, um, is it through content? Is it through, you know, not just necessarily checking a box, right? Where I remember I worked at certain jobs and I only really worked at two, but you know, sometimes we're just checking a box. We might go to a, a food pantry with a, with a shirt on that have our company. And then we take a photo op and we up out of there or we could actually be ingrained in the true society and true culture and so I think you guys have the ability to really, from a content standpoint, set yourself aside from your peers. Because I understand, you know, from a compliance standpoint, it took a while for everybody to get comfortable with social media. And is this compliant or not? Right. You got your back office seeing, et cetera. But now I think, you know, people are saying, OK, we could actually post this. We could say this. And I think you guys, you know, getting more ingrained with the society and the culture, you, you guys are continuing to set yourself apart and actually make a difference. The other thing I'll add to that too, because I understand both sides, right? Because you are still a business and your 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 like your bottom line matters. So sometimes it's also understanding what helps increase your bottom line. And sometimes at a lot of financial institutions, African Americans don't contribute to the majority of their like when, when I think about JP Morgan, like asset management and investment banking are their dominant revenue streams, literally. You, I don't know how many African-American clients they have or black companies they're IPOing. So it's also figuring out and talking to people who make those decisions like, hey, my audience may not make the biggest dent in your bottom line for your shareholders. What else can we do instead? And I think that's the other issue, too. Some, it's easier to market to a black person to buy it, buy something than to market to a black person to build wealth. So if I'm a financial institution is it really worth the investment if it doesn't thoroughly impact my bottom line because I answer to my shareholders? So 
So I think it's about having a further conversation on how we can be intentional with the resources that are allocated to Black people and making sure we determine the ROIs that we want for our bottom line, not the company shareholders. Well, that's good. And that brings me, I'm going to I'm going to use that to wheel in this this question and then we'll open up a couple um, at the last 10 minutes. But when you think about that bottom line, right, I, I thought about the Warren Buffett, right, value investing. What does that mean? That means looking at the long term, right? So when we talk about thinking about that bottom line, is it just for this quarter, for this year, or are we thinking about the impact or what can change or be shifted in the future. So Ashley, your platform, like you said, you help people, you helped invest what two and a half million dollars, but you're starting with the education of youth and then started to expand that to adults, right? Ross, you do some of the best and cutest videos with your baby girl, Rossi, um, and you give her financial advice and you mentioned and you said you are what you're exposed to. So I have to think that when we think about the impact that the Black community has on the bottom line, maybe it's not imminent. But what can happen to the value in the long term if you start planting seeds now? And it seems like that's what you all are starting to do with your platforms. So I just want to have you take a moment, and Ross, you can kick it off with sharing your vision, you know, where, how do you, why are you investing? You know, how you're thinking about your bottom line, right? Where do you see the value? Where do you see the vision of your platform going? Um, and how do you hope to attain it? Well, one, what I'll say is this, right? I think it's very important to continue effectively the fight, right? I look at it as a digital fight. I look at it as some of the work that we are doing Ash and I and many peers in the industry is what we have is a digital civil rights movement where we are now focusing on what my brand says, Black Wealth Matters, understanding that how do we have, because, you know, Wendell said something earlier, right? We have in the same police brutality that we experienced since the beginning of time, right? And it still persists today. And so one of the things that doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. That's the definition of insanity. So for me, my focus is getting black people to understand why attaining true wealth is important. And more importantly, here's the blueprint to getting that. And so for me, it's continuing to say, how could I impact millions of people to not expect instant gratification, right? Like Ashley said, right? If I didn't necessarily come from generational wealth, so therefore I have to be the first person to create it, right? There has to be one person in every family tree that something switches and say, okay, my grandparents didn't have it or my parents didn't have it, et cetera. I got to start it. And so what is the type of content that I'm creating that's going to, you know, switch a light bulb in a certain person's head. And so one of the things I do as I'm, you know, as I'm driving with my daughter, she's two years old, but guess what? If my daughter and I are having conversations about what might impact the market after Jerome Powell speaks and whether he decides to raise rates or not, what's, what, how does that impact everything, the entire society, right? From borrowing costs and companies' willingness to reinvest or cutting costs by laying people off or how are we talking about how to improve our credit score, et cetera. So my thing is continuing to have the conversations that effectively have been taboo. No one likes to talk about money no more in our society. We'll quickly talk about who's a better basketball player, Kevin Durant or LeBron James, but how often are we arguing in the barbershops who is a better CEO or better company, right? Are we, would you rather put money in Amazon or Apple, right? Or Tesla or, you know, Microsoft, right? And so I think at the end of the day, it's having those conversations, making people more comfortable with saying, all right, I can now get comfortable about talking about the things that were never once taught to me. And that's what my brand is all about, right? Black Wealth Matters, I feel as though is a strong movement that people are waking up, but still nonetheless, we're swimming in a lot of knowledge, but we still are yearning um, for becoming, you know, smart about certain things, right? It's like, we need to help focus people into the right direction, no longer thinking about instant gratification. So for me, when I started Empify, it was really not about money. Um, it was about, Empify is the word empower and modify merge together. Um, because I knew the biggest shift that we needed was our mentality shift, right? If I can change your mindset, I can change your bank account. 
And so when I started Empify, first it was a financial advisor, um, learned targeting low to moderate income people, realized that I can only serve 12 people a day if I sat down and did a meeting every day. And so I started to teach kids. So we implemented programs in school systems. We started to implement programs in prison systems. And then we got to a point where too many people were reaching out and we couldn't scale. And that's when I realized we needed technology. When the pandemic hit and the market crashed, I, I lived through the 2008 crash, but I was in my college dorm room. So I was watching, but I didn't know what I was doing. The 2020 crash, I was waiting for that. It was long overdue. And I literally went shopping and I brought my community with me. During the pandemic, we launched our Wealth Builders community, which is our membership-based platform. To then now turning Amplify to what was an education-based company to now a FinTech company, where people were like the Netflix of finance. People have access to financial education, over 250 hours of classes in the palm of their hand. We got to a point now where over 2,500 people, we've invested over 2.5 million. My goal now is to invest $10 million. This is their money, not mine. I don't advise, I educate, but the difference is I'm not here to just get you juiced up and educate you, I produce results, right? I can get you to open multiple brokerage accounts, turn it, turn someone who's never been an investor to become an investor. So when I think about Empify in the future, what Kleenex is to tissues is what Empify is to financial education. Whether you are a child, whether you are incarcerated, whether you are an adult, whether you are in retirement, you should have access to financial education because you cannot just walk into a bank and say, hey, I don't know how to invest. I don't have money. I have a bad credit score. What can I do? You shouldn't not, you shouldn't feel like you are alone in that process. And so now as we expand our technology arm, we now are going to implement technology that can produce the financial IQ of a person. Because it's not that Morningstar or any of these financial institutions are bad, it's that their job is not to serve, provide, and educate. They are there to sell products and services. Now, I don't wanna be, I don't wanna be a bank, right? But I can get a lot of people to open bank accounts through the education we create because our education is results driven. And so the ultimate goal is to get to a space where we can partner with companies, which we do, but on a massive level where, hey, if you want our audience to be financially educated, to be qualified for your product or service, you got to go through Empify to get that because we're able to produce a financially literate adult and child to be able to utilize the resources that Americans have access to in this country. So whether we are a brick and mortar online platform, it's literally when you say, hey, my child is getting their first job. Let me go to Empify to figure out what they need to do, where they need to go, because I know that I'm not being sold a product. The more people we impact, the bigger we get versus the more products we sell. No, I have to impact you first. I have to impact your heart, your mind, cultivate a change for you to then actually buy into who we are. And so for me, it's literally giving people that space where if we could pay $100,000 to go to college, you can pay to get access to financial education where it directly benefits your bottom line not the bottom line of a company that you decide to work for because you went to college and got a job after school. Fantastic. Uh, we had two minutes left. So this probably should have been longer. I don't know. Maybe we're going to have to run it back. Um, I, I want to use up every minute. I want to say thank you to everybody. I want to I wanna say thank you first and foremost to Ashley and Ross for joining us. Um, just really appreciative of you all taking the time, appreciative of all the work that you're doing in the community. I wanted to see if you all could do a 30 second real spiel, just answering the question, why is it important to invest in community? Ross, one word, two words. Why is it important to invest in the community? Yep. No, 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 I was just, you know, I get my, I think, I don't say, um, I just pause, you know, Good. but a uh, great question. So why is it important to invest in the community? I think the community represents us as a society. And so once you're giving back to the community, I think you are looking and saying, how can I make a better world, a better America, a better neighborhood for my world by investing in them? You are thinking about the future. Awesome. Ashley? Um, because I think we all have realized that we cannot depend on the government or our families to be able to change our family's legacy. So I think it's about time that we look in the mirror and recognize the person in the mirror is the person whose job is to build wealth. And I think building wealth is about laying brick by brick to build that foundation. And I think we have to get to a space where we no longer operate like we are the victim. We literally dominate this country. But there is no stock market without the black dollar. Like it's not. So it's like, hey, there's two ways to build wealth in this country. You either create your own idea or you invest in somebody else's idea. So at this point, 
you got to pick one, but you cannot save your way to wealth and you cannot work your way to wealth. And your family's last name matters more than anything happening or anything going on outside of your family. And I believe it is our job to change that. So instead of focusing on just the problem, let's understand the problem and cultivate solutions together. Awesome. Us dominate and together. Thank you all so much.